The topic of our first lecture in COM 412 is going to focus on the social construction of gender or how gender functions as a social construct. But before we can understand how gender is something that's socially constructed, we need to have a nuts and bolts understanding of what social construction theory is. So to do this first, we need to understand that there's a distinction between signs and symbols. Signs and symbols are not synonyms for one another. A sign is when there is a direct relationship between two phenomena. For instance, if you smell smoke in your house or you see smoke, you're going to assume that a fire is present in your home because there is a direct relationship between smoke and fire. Regardless of whether or not humans were present, smoke would be around fire. Now, a symbol is different because a symbol refers to an indirect, arbitrary relationship that humans construct between two or more phenomena. It's how we symbolize our world. For instance, in literature a lot of times, fire is used by authors to represent conflict. But it's not like a sign because there's not a direct relationship between fire and conflict. For instance, if you argue with one of your friends, the furniture around you doesn't combust into flames. Instead, the metaphorical relationship that humans have constructed between fire and conflict is just one way that they symbolize their world or metaphorically render it. So social construction focuses with the world of symbols or symbolic communication. And social constructivists ask a very basic question. How do humans co-create, institutionalize, and maintain a shared meaning? For instance, in the United States, we value patriotism. But what does patriotism mean? Well, we have a bunch of narratives that um, detail different accounts of U.S. history that give us a sense of what patriotism is. Patriotism is serving your country. It's being willing to die for your country. All of these narratives working together that all school children in the context of the United States learn about help us create a shared meaning of patriotism, right? So it's not completely subjective. Rather, it's intersubjective. Next, meaning is shaped by socio-historical location. So uh, meanings are culturally relative. Not everything has the same meaning in all cultures. Uh, for instance, my father was born in 1920, and his understanding of gender relationships was vastly different than mine. I was born in the 1970s. So when I would go out to restaurants with my father and he would call waitresses things like, hey, honey, or hey, toots, can I get this? It always made my face turn completely red. I couldn't believe that my father would greet a waitress in that way, but he was a product of a different time and a different place. So when we talk about socio-historical location constraining and enabling meaning, we're talking about the time and place in which one is embedded. Many of the things that we assume are natural are actually cultural constructs. So you'll see whenever people are having fierce debates about things like marriage or gender relationships, they treat these human-constructed institutions um, as if this is just the natural way things are done. Like uh, a, a number of people will claim, well, this is the right way to do marriage, and it's just always been this way. Well, no, in fact, it hasn't always been this way. Marriage is a cultural construct that changes from time to time and changes from culture to culture, and the same thing with gender. So social construction relies on processes of socialization, where individuals learn and internalize customs, habits, and values. In other words, when babies are born, they're not born with this, this innate ability to understand what the rules of a particular culture are. Instead, they have to learn the rules of the culture by breaking customs, breaking habits, and then being rewarded or punished for specific behaviors in which they engage. And this is known as their processes of socialization. And there are a number of different institutions in our day-to-day -day life that help socialize us. In the world of social construction theory, socialization is split into three primary categories. The first category is primary socialization. The second, according to Berger and Luckman, 
is secondary socialization. And then the final category is reality maintenance. So we'll discuss each of these levels of socialization in more detail, beginning with primary socialization. Social constructivist theorists argue that primary socialization occurs in early childhood. And this is when children learn the very basic rules of society. Um, and they tend to learn these rules from their caregivers. They will, um, a caregiver, if they see a child doing something that the child shouldn't do, will say, don't. They might work to shame the child. They, you know, they want to teach the child that this is basic, inappropriate behavior. So, for instance, there comes an age where a little boy or a little girl can't just run around public in the nude, no matter what the context is. There's always that age where it's like, oh, honey, no, you really need to go put, you know, a, a diaper on or put some clothes on. Um, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, my father was both mother and father to me. He was he was the one who raised me. And I would always run around the house with no pants on up until the time I was like four years old until my brothers and sisters who were a, a bit older than me would say, you can't do that. That's so embarrassing. So I learned the basics of my socialization that I should feel nude. Whenever I'm nude, I should feel a sense of shame. After we learn the very basic rules, and by basic rules, I mean it's not complex at all. You know, we're just getting a very basic understanding of how the world works. Then we move into processes of secondary socialization. And se secondary socialization occurs from childhood through adolescence. And this is when somebody learns more role-specific knowledge. They get more nuanced understandings of the roles that they have to play in a culture. And a number of different institutions help mold these beliefs. It's not just the caregiver who's telling the child, you know, this is the right or wrong way to act. Um, some of these institutions that help socialize us during secondary socialization include schools, church, nation, you know, national discourses. And each institution exerts its influence by way of official and unofficial discourses. So um, sometimes the rules will be explicit, like um, boys and girls have to go into different bathrooms in elementary school, and this is, you know, a spoken rule. And other times it will be more uh, subtle. So we might encourage boys to be more active in PE class, or we might encourage girls to be more artistic in the classes that they take. And there's no written rule when it comes to this, but like the educational institution does definitely suggest that children should conform to certain gendered behaviors. So each institution exerts its influence, and sometimes there will be competing discourses that try to push and pull the, children, the child into different directions. Um, so an, an example of another type of institution that teaches children really complex roles would be the Boy Scouts of America. And in the Boy Scouts, boys have to wear a particular uniform and they earn specific badges for specific behaviors in which they might engage. And all of these behaviors are meant to symbolize the correct way to perform masculinity. So a kid will earn a badge for tying knots or whittling wood or camping. And all of these are very masculine activities that are meant to socialize the young boy into being a man. So after a kid is done with secondary socialization, he or she will spend the rest of his or her life maintaining their sense of identity and the reality that they've constructed for themselves. They will seek out things that affirm their values and beliefs. And this happens every single day of their lives. Mundane, everyday, redundant acts of communication both constantly reaffirm and sometimes challenge our intersubjective understandings of reality. We maintain our socially constructed worlds by identifying with symbols that best fit into our subjective and socially constructed reality. In fact, communication research shows that people, you know, like with cable news now, cable, cable news is very ideologically divided. You have more liberal 
uh, cable news like MSNBC and the more socially, pro uh, socially conservative news like Fox News. And communication research suggests that people, when they're deciding what news network they want to watch, they don't tend to flock to stations or channels where the journalists are going to challenge their values and beliefs. Instead, they seek out journalists who will tell them uh, they agree with the things that they already believe in. So that's one of the ways that we maintain our reality. We seek out things that affirm our values and our beliefs and our norms. Identity is definitely a social construct. Some of the most basic aspects of our identity, things like race, gender, sexuality, are social constructs that a number of people confuse for biological realities. And it's not to say that there isn't um, a sense of biology helping to determine these traits. Like certainly phenotype helps construct our understanding of race, gender, and sexuality, but it's a lot more complicated than biology determining these things. Things like race, gender, and sexuality are also very much social constructs. And to illustrate this idea, I'm going to talk about one of my office mates um, when I was getting my PhD at ASU. Her name's Elvanette. And Elvanette is a black woman from the Caribbean, and um, she came to the United States to get her PhD, and a number of people would confuse Elvanette for an African American, which she's not. She's from the Caribbean. She's not even a U.S. citizen. And uh, I think it's easy for people to look at something like phenotype and then project a social construct, a human constructed label like African American or black or white or, you know, whatever the case may be, onto an individual regardless of whether or not that's an appropriate label to place with that individual. And there is a pretty popular quote that one is not born woman or black or heterosexual. One becomes these things by way of socialization. We are socialized into our understanding of what constitutes man, what constitutes woman, what constitutes black or white or gay or heterosexual. All of these things are uh, social constructs. They're the differences that make a difference. So why study gender issues under a social constructivist frame? First, gender issues are both personal and political. And what I mean by that is a lot of issues related to gender are framed as personal, uh, personal business, like um, a lot of times spousal abuse will be uh, an abuse, whether it's emotional, verbal, physical, a lot of times spousal abuse will be constructed as, oh, well, that's something personal. It's going on in the privacy of their own home. We don't want to get involved. That's what neighbors always say. We're, we're not going to get involved. But when you look at the statistics regarding spousal abuse, and I'm just going with this as an example, I think the statistic is upward of anywhere between like 25%, upward to 50% of women are abused at some time by their spouse. So when you look at how this is happening at an epidemic rate, something that is constructed as personal requires political intervention. It's something that people should be talking about in the political sphere. Gender issues are almost also systemic. And what I mean by that is that they're system-wide, regardless of individual belief. For instance, you don't have to identify as a sexist or communicate in a sexist way each and every day of your life to benefit from a sexist system. I know a ton of men who I wouldn't necessarily classify as overtly, explicitly sexist, but that doesn't mean that they don't benefit from sexist systems, which pay men more than women for performing the same job, or in the educational realm, um, stories tend to be about men. We read books that are authored by white men. You know, these are things that benefit men regardless of whether or not they identify as a sexist. Next, racism, sexism, and homophobia are built into the very structures of how we communicate. And this is a really important point, because a lot of times I'll hear uh, people say, oh, I'm not racist. 
I'm not sexist or I'm not homophobic, but what these people fail to realize is that racism, sexism, and homophobia are built into how we talk to one another. For instance, male generic language. Male generic language, which we'll discuss at greater length at the uh, midpoint in the semester, is when we use man, men, and other male pronouns to refer to both men and women. And by doing this, we first highlight men and make it seem like they exclusively play the roles that we're referring to. And then we also wall out the women's experiences who also may be participating in this role. So some specific examples of male generic language might be congress per, or congressman instead of congressperson, or a policeman or fireman. Because when you use man as a reference to both men and women, you make it seem like it would be odd for a woman to play that role. So this just gives you an idea of how sexism is built into the very structures of how we communicate. It's built into our language, so we all, in a way, are racist, sexist, and homophobic. Inequality is also a social construct, and this is a theme that we'll be discussing for the duration of the semester. Western cultures socially construct sex, gender, sexuality, and class via communication and discourse. We then use communication to designate superiority and inferiority. Um, and sometimes it will be very explicit in the ways that we communicate this superiority or inferiority. Um, other times it's more subtle and taken for granted and kind of built into the vernacular or how we talk day to day. So for instance, when people say that's so gay, when they mean to say that's weak or I don't like that or I think you're stupid, the association there that they're making is that gay people are weak or not to be valued or stupid. There's a connection, a metaphorical connection or relationship that's being built there. Another example of this would be the trope of darkness in Western literature. And what I mean by that is if you look at the history of uh, literature in the United States and also the rhetorical tradition dating all the way back to ancient Greece over 2,000 years ago, whenever people mention blackness and whiteness in literature, Many times, blackness is conflated with things that you can't trust, things that are out to get you, things that are suspicious, and evilness. And whiteness is constructed as pure, truthful, honest, good, innocent. Not surprisingly, we treat white people by and large the same way that we construct this metaphor of whiteness, and also we treat people who are not white as suspicious not to be trusted, you know, all of these things that fall in line with the trope of darkness. So there are subtle ways that we go about communicating superiority and inferiority and socially constructing inequality in our day-to-day -day communication and literature. So what happens is that people internalize inferiority and superiority. So the trope of darkness shapes understandings of people who aren't white. In other words, words matter. And you should have a commitment to this idea of words mattering because you're probably a communication major if you're in this class. If you're a communication major, one of the reasons why you're a communication major is because you believe communication matters. You do think that it makes a difference. How we communicate does in fact alter the world that we live in. So recognizing inequality as a social construct allows us to question and resist its continuation. And sometimes we may have conversations in class where you think, oh, maybe this group of people, maybe this group of women or this uh, marginalized group in our culture, maybe they're being a little bit too sensitive. Whenever you feel that inclination or that reflex reaction uh, emerge, I really want you to take into consideration why you decided to become a communication major. Like I said, you did because you do believe words matter. So in the context of this class, everyone is encouraged to challenge mundane acts of communication that construct inferior and superior groups. So for instance, when people talk about men uh, in their class, they typically will refer to them as guys or men. But more often than not, women 
in college are referred to as girls, which is diminutive. It's a way of making them seem lesser. So if I hear people in class referring to women, because everybody in the class is a grown woman, um, other than the men, uh, if I hear people referring to the women as girls, I might challenge you on that and ask you to call them women. Because this is, again, just a subtle way that we make this distinction between inferior and superior genderings of people. So that is the end of our social construction and gender theory. Um, yep, that's it.